Here follows an extract from my book Artful Designs, available from Amazon. Chapter 20, Part 3 Let's look at this logically and see who is left, James began. Although there are others in the museum circles who have access to the building and security lodge, most lack the necessary skills. Brian might surprise us with his computer skills, but never in a thousand years would he stage a murder scene to represent the mechanics of an old master. None of the ancillary staff could. Whereas I could stage the scene, but haven't the computer skills to doctor the footage, nor could I murder any of my colleagues, but I hope that doesn't need stating, interjected Drew. Exactly, said James. He knew that it was time to lay all of his cards on the table. James took a deep breath and then took the plunge. Very quietly he said, However, your young friend now has all of those skills at his command. Scott, you can't be serious, said Drew. And why not, said Beth. Drew looked at Beth as though she'd shot him through the heart. She laid her hand gently on her husband's arm and said, Benji said that we must put our personal concerns to one side. Let Scott face the spotlight as you have done. If he's as true as you believe him to be, he'll stand the test. I'm sure he's innocent, said Drew, but I'm not sure he's strong enough to stand all of this. If nobody else is found to be guilty and Scott isn't actually proved to be innocent, it'll finish him. James stayed true to his course and continued. Viewing matters objectively, he could have done it. He obviously has the editing skills. Now he also has the artistic knowledge and he does have obvious links to Finn. We have been led to believe that those old ties are broken, but we only have Scott's word. Do we know for sure? Maybe he wanted to introduce his old friend to a new level. But how does this help us progress any further forward, said Maddox. We suspected these very same people right at the start and, two murders later, we still have no evidence. And what about motive? I can see that any of these three would have had the means, but I'm struggling to see any motive. Although, I have to be honest here and say that I've struggled with that from the start, too. I can't comprehend why anyone would go to the trouble of stealing a painting that anyone can take a look at and nobody could easily sell, let alone kill for it. If only everyone had your honest heart, Maddox, said James. Let's look at the possible motives for each in turn. We'll start with Theo. He spent his life building up this collection which has always been a passion of his. Maybe he decided it was time he had one for himself. Did he need some money? We're looking into his finances to find out. Or maybe he was part of the same group that Rick belonged to and was under orders against his own inclination but was powerless to refuse. Maybe he was involved in the theft from Mag all those years ago but this time, for whatever reason, matters didn't progress so smoothly. Whatever you suggest sounds so far-fetched. Either Theo was part of an illicit gang or he was overwhelmed by a craving to bask in the glory of a masterpiece in the privacy of his own living room. Didn't your police specialist say that art crimes were never really about the art after all, but were a form of quick collateral, said Maddox. It does sound like a movie, doesn't it? These are just theories to be put to the test, said James. Let's carry on, no matter how ludicrous it seems. Let's move our attention to Jefferson. It'd be just to his fancy to belong to some dubious art underworld. He'd steal, whether for himself or to order, of that I have no doubt. And he had a tattoo in the same place as Rick, said Maddox. Is it likely that he'd steal for money? Is he as rich as he makes out, said James. I do know that his business interests are struggling, said Beth. Seeing the surprise on everyone's face, she recounted her time at Hyacinth's bedside. Conrad had reassured Hyacinth that it's perfectly in the run of normal ups and downs of business, but she did admit that the combined worry of business and the trouble at the gallery was getting to both of them. Hyacinth said that Conrad just wasn't acting like his usual self these days, and that worried him more than the financial concerns. 
Would he know how to sell it on, though, said Maddox. Who knows what contacts Jefferson made on the inside, said James. You can be sure that he only moved in the highest circles, whether out in civilian life or inside a prison. Some people trade information for a packet of cigarettes, but that will not have been Jefferson's metier. What about Scott? asked Drew. What possible motive could he have? He couldn't shift a painting on the black market and he certainly doesn't move in influential circles. That young man is a quick learner. He'd soon know to talk to Rick or anyone else in that line if the inclination suited him. He's clever and astute and we don't really know for certain whether he'd use that brain of his for good or ill. He's well placed to make use of his old friends and also to make his way with a new set. If it suited Scott's purpose to mix with the wrong crowd in the new world he'd found himself in, he'd certainly be up to the task. Maybe you weren't the only one to take him under their wing, Drew. Perhaps Scott was more than ready to prove his worth to less honourable souls than yours, said James. Perhaps Scott thought it could grant him acceptance into an elite artistic society, which was less savoury than the one Drew knows. Weren't we told that art was sometimes stolen to provide a sort of status symbol, said Maddox. Who on earth could he brag about it to, said Drew. You've seen where he lives. They'd be more impressed if he nicked a PlayStation. His old friends, maybe, but his new set, said James. He doesn't have a new set, said Drew. Realising the futility of his remonstrance, he sighed. I guess I'll have to let you find that out for yourself. Beth smiled at Drew encouragingly to confirm that this is what she'd meant in her earlier statement. Drew was still troubled though. Unless Forbes uncovers any evidence, we're at stalemate until we find the painting. I do hope it's not in the rubbish heap somewhere, otherwise suspicion will be hanging over all of our heads indefinitely. I don't hold out much hope for forensics opening any new lines of inquiry. Any evidence that is at the murder scene has every right to be there. No doubt Theo's DNA will be all over Sally's body, if you bear in mind their relationship. And trace evidence is bound to occur simply because she'd have been in working contact with Conrad and Scott on a regular basis, said James. So it really does come down to where is it? Before we can say who done it, doesn't it? said Maddox. Unless we get an unexpected lucky break, I believe so, said James. Which now brings us to you, Beth. What have you got up your sleeve? I wasn't being unduly modest when I said that I hardly know. I've been looking at historical cases for inspiration, but nothing seemed to ring a bell. However, just before you arrived, I came across a case in which the artwork has never been found and conspiracy still rages about the stolen piece. Something about the story has caught my attention, and yet I hardly know what or why, said Beth. Recently, those who are still searching thought that they knew where it was hidden, only to find that, in past generations, somebody got there before them, and now the piece is missing again. I can't say why it's grabbed my attention and before I could properly think about it you came and I've lost my train of thought. Leave it with me and I'll have another think. Don't get too excited but I do have the beginning of a shadow of an idea. It's not much I know but I hope it will help eventually once I've gathered my thoughts again. Don't be disappointed if it's all nothing in the end. I know how you work Beth said James. And I know not to ignore it when you pick up a scent. Trust your instincts and call me if there's anything I can do to help. I can even take you to Argyle to see if he can help. He might even offer you a job. Beth waved away her brother's jest. He was always trying to get her employed for her sleuthing skills. However, Beth knew that it would be all wrong. Her instinct ran an unusual vein where imperceptible parallels in her domestic world led her to conclusions via very abstract avenues. She knew that if she was required to work to schedule, it would kill any inspiration she had. She knew where she worked best and enjoyed it all the more for that. 
Their grandmother had been content to work in obscurity during the war years at Bletchley Park and had then, after helping to save the world, to remain sworn to secrecy and to employ her skills in unknown ways as she raised her family. No tinge of resentment was ever evident and Beth was proud to follow in her footsteps. She didn't need an official accolade. Benedict always said that he lacked the strength to work in such anonymity. It was no effort to Beth. In fact, it was a positive joy to her. So why upset matters? Benedict was happy to take the official line and Beth was genuinely happy to remain in the background. They were a perfect team, so why look for a change? For the full book of Artful Designs, available in paperback or as an e-book, follow the link in the cards in the description box or find details on my website at SharonBill.com. Thanks for listening.